Welcome to this UCL lunchtime lecture on do we live in more anxious times and are we equipped to deal with them? My name is Professor Nick Fremantle. I currently lead UCL's Comprehensive Clinical Trials, Trials Unit and I'll be chairing today's lecture alongside my colleague Owen Nazareth, Professor in the Department of Primary Care and Population Health. And now to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. April Slee. Now, April received her PhD in primary care and population health at UCL in, in 2022, and she's worked in a biostatistician on the design and analysis of clinical trials for the past 21 years or so, and is an honorary senior research fellow at UCL's Institute of Clinical Trials and Methodology. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we will have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, uh, and we're very keen to hear from you. And these can be submitted at any point during April's talk by going to the Slido and uh, enter into your internet browser and enter the event code um, at anxious times. I will now hand over to April for her talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nick, for the kind introduction and especially thank the organizers of this forum. Uh, the title of my talk is, Do We Live in More Anxious Times and Are We Equipped to Deal with Them? Uh, this collaboration is with Nick and Erwin Nazareth with help from many others. Here's a brief summary of our disclosures. This is an outline of my talk. Essentially, I'm going to give an overview of generalized anxiety show how the rates of anxiety have changed over time, review the efficacy and tolerability of available drug treatments, summarize recent trends in prescribing, and hopefully set us up for a good discussion about a path forward. We'll start with an overview of generalized anxiety. So a reasonable starting point for understanding anxiety is to compare what we mean by pathological anxiety to emotions that everyone has experienced like fear and worry. The distinctions might seem subtle and unnecessary, but the goal here is to try to draw a line separating pathological anxiety, that is the disease of anxiety, from emotions that are not an illness and can even be useful. First, fear and anxiety are both negative feelings of unease related to something bad that may happen. Second, with fear, the something is usually specific. I happen to be afraid of spiders. When I tell you that I'm afraid of spiders, you can understand my fear, even if you don't share it. In contrast with anxiety, the something might be murky and formless. It can be really frustrating for a person suffering from anxiety to try to explain their distress that something terrible might happen, when the something is either unclear or hard to put into words. Fear is part of the ancient structure in our brain that we share with animals, while anxiety is a much more recent development. So the third distinction is that fear requires context. For example, dogs don't start being afraid of a trip to the vet until we pull into the parking lot. They don't obsess about it for weeks in advance. Similarly, my fear of spiders only comes up when, for example, I realize I'm sharing my shower with a spider. I wasn't thinking about spiders prior to the shower, and I have no fear until I become aware of the spider, even if it was there the whole time. Finally, fear feels like an instinct. It isn't the product of careful thought. It's a more immediate gut-level knowing. And as we'll see, thinking is a critical part of anxiety. The way we think about things can make it better or worse. Now let's talk about worry. First, like fear, worry and anxiety disorders share the negative feeling that something bad might happen. Second, I mentioned the ability to lose sleep about something that isn't happening right now is a more recent evolution in humans. This capacity helps us think in terms of risk. Worry is what made our ancestors plan for things that were totally predictable, like 
needing to survive the winter, but some healthy level of worry, producing at worst moderate unease, is why we undergo cancer screenings by car insurance, own fire extinguishers. This is a very important difference. Healthy worry leads to planning and action. Pathological anxiety interferes with our ability to plan and can make action impossible. Third, the feeling of unease can become so severe that nothing else matters. Finally, and related, healthy worry might be distracting, but it doesn't prevent us from doing the things we need to do. Normal worry crosses over into pathological anxiety when it impacts our ability to function and shoulder our responsibilities. As an illustrative example, I was really anxious about giving this lecture. Now, some amount of worry was motivating. I wanted it to be interesting and largely coherent. But at some point, I became worried that what I had to say wouldn't be good enough. And then all my momentum ground to a halt. This lecture was more important to me than anything else I was doing. So I couldn't justify doing anything else until it was perfect, which, of course, it couldn't be. So my other work started piling up, and I was spending hours every day staring at a blank PowerPoint template. Like many mental illnesses, symptoms that are an obvious problem in others are sometimes hard to recognize in ourselves. And finally, it was other people who started pointing out that I was thinking about this talk all the time and making absolutely no progress. I needed to treat this more like pathological anxiety rather than deluding myself that it was appropriate worry. And so for me, the choices at that point were to get honest about what was happening or else not be able to give any talk, let alone a half decent one. Now I should clarify that the focus of the research I'm presenting today is generalized anxiety. There are other types of anxiety disorders, including panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and specific phobias. However, generalized anxiety is the most common anxiety disorder, and its hallmark is a persistent feeling of dread that's become too big to lead to constructive planning and action. Generalized anxiety can be considered a syndrome as it often produces a collection of symptoms that frequently occur together. Fortunately, the symptoms have substantial overlap with other physical and mental health problems. Unfortunately, because this often leads to misdiagnosis. So the physical symptoms of anxiety may manifest like fear, rapid heartbeat, sweating, losing sleep. But anxiety can also produce physical symptoms like an upset stomach or a headache, especially in children. The psychological symptom of worry is really the defining characteristic of anxiety, but problems that are either concurrent or caused by the worry, such as difficulty concentrating and restlessness, can also make diagnosing anxiety pretty difficult. One study showed that in a primary care setting, generalized anxiety disorder is only identified and initially diagnosed correctly in about one out of three people with anxiety. It's also important to note the major, lap in over, the major overlap in symptoms between anxiety and depression. The clinical definitions of both conditions include difficulty concentrating, restlessness, and sleep disturbances. They can occur simultaneously or sequentially, but all in all, about 62% of patients with generalized anxiety disorder had at least one episode of major depressive disorder at some point during their lifetime. And there's an intuitive overlap in these conditions. Uh, depression is often linked to ruminating about things that have happened, while anxiety is related to worrying about things that might happen in the future. It isn't surprising that mindfulness, roughly being engaged and present in the current moment, can be very helpful in both conditions. So now we're going to have a look at the trends in incidence over time. 
So how do we understand the magnitude of anxiety in our communities? And how do we know if anxiety as a societal problem is getting better or worse? It's actually a difficult problem. This picture is meant to illustrate four different types of people suffering from anxiety disorders. So starting from the top, the people we're most aware of are the ones who require admission to psychiatric hospitals. These patients tend to have the most severe disease and it's often reached the point of major disability or self-harm attempts. Below this, the second group of people is larger than the first group. These are people with anxiety disorders recognized by their GPs who are hopefully prescribed appropriate treatment and managed as ambulatory patients. So these two groups. Um, these two groups form the proverbial tip of the iceberg. They represent a small visible subset of all people impacted by anxiety disorders. However, these are the patients who are likely to be identifiable as anxiety sufferers in national, national general practice and hospital databases. Although changes in the rates of anxiety among these groups probably indicate changes in the rates for the general population, we know that the absolute rates might be quite different if we had the capacity to say, screen everybody in UK for an anxiety disorder. So coming down to the third level of the iceberg, which is not visible in the kind of incident study we performed, this represents people with anxiety disorders who presented to their primary care practitioners with symptoms, but the symptoms were not identified as related to an anxiety disorder. We talked about how many of the physical and psychological symptoms of the anxiety syndrome are not very specific. So some of the people in this third level probably left their GP with a misdiagnosis of headaches or insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome, attention deficit disorder, or any myriad of other diagnoses. Importantly, this group did seek help from their GP, but the GP recorded a diagnosis other than an anxiety disorder. Finally, the fourth and largest group are the people with anxiety disorders who don't seek help at all. And there can be a variety of reasons for this. Some people don't connect physical symptoms of anxiety like headaches to a treatable illness. Others are aware that their worry is difficult to control and encroaching on important aspects of their life, but they may not seek care due to the stigma surrounding mental illness. These are these two groups. Better awareness of anxiety disorders among GPs might help people move from the third group who are misdiagnosed into the second group who are correctly diagnosed with anxiety disorders. But people who don't seek care at all will be entirely overlooked unless they participate in something like a community-based anxiety screening. So my colleagues and I looked at how the rates of generalized anxiety changed in the UK over time using a database called the Health Improvement Network or THIN, which is actually several terabytes in size. But it's a longitudinal database in which general practitioners enter medical diagnoses and symptoms and treatments, including drug therapies and referrals to psychological therapies. Essentially, it's an electronic health record. The THIN database provides a record of every GP visit for patients registered with a participating practice. So the THIN database contains a complete clinical record of all people registered with the practice. This means that we can use THIN to analyze trends and patterns in the data and to identify changes or developments that happen over time. It includes practices that are spread throughout the UK and approximately 6% of the total UK population. Studies have shown that the demographics of patients included in THIN, that is characteristics like age, gender, and race, are fairly representative of the UK population as a whole. Also, 
the rates of a broad range of medical, medical conditions in the thin database are pretty similar to the rates of these illnesses in the UK population. So while 6% might seem like a small number, the similar demographics and similar disease rates suggest that trends in thin are probably generalizable to the UK general practice population as a whole. The incidence rates of generalized anxiety that I'm going to show are basically the number of people with generalized anxiety disorder or symptoms recorded for the first time each year, divided by the number of people who were registered with a GP for that year and who didn't already have a generalized anxiety disorder or symptoms in their record. Person years at risk, PYAR, is the shorthand for the denominator in these incidence rates. The rates of generalized anxiety are known to vary by age and sex. So we calculated the rates by age, sex, and year over the 20 year period from January 1998 through December 2018. <clears throat> Here are the generalized anxiety rates among patients age 55 and older. So the solid lines represent women and the dashed lines represent men. The rates for women considerably exceed the rates for men among all age groups, which is consistent with other population-based studies. These older patients show recent stability or maybe even a slight decrease in generalized anxiety rates more recently. For men and women between the ages of 45 and 54, in orange and between 35 and 44 in pink, we do see an increase in rates of anxiety recording over time. This increase appears just after 2008 and it might partly reflect the impact of the financial crisis, but the rates for men and women are tracking. So the distance between the two orange lines and between the two pink lines are similar over time. Finally, for men and women between the ages of 25 and 34, in blue, and between 18 and 24, in red, we see dramatic increases in the rates of anxiety between 2014 and 2018, and these are really quite striking. The increases occur for both men and women, but the uptick is disproportionately impacting young women. Remember that this graph shows the combined rates of recording anxiety disorders and anxiety symptoms, but we also saw the same patterns when we considered only anxiety disorders and only anxiety symptoms. One possible explanation for the recent increase in anxiety recording could be that the distinction between anxiety and depression is relatively recent. The National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, first issued treatment guidelines for depression in 2004 and has updated them several times since. The first NICE guidelines for anxiety were actually issued in 2011. So we thought maybe the symptom overlap between anxiety or depression and the lack of specific guidelines for anxiety were causing what appeared to be an increase, but it was actually just a difference in how the same clinical manifestations were being recorded. That is, maybe prior to 2011, anxiety was just being recorded as depression. To determine whether a reporting change was causing the apparent anxiety increase, we looked at the combined diagnosis of anxiety and depression over the same time period. And this is a graph of those results. In particular, the sharp recent increases in either diagnosis persist for the youngest patients among both men and women. There's also a more modest increase among men aged 25 to 34 years. The combined rate has actually fallen for women 45 years of age and older, 
and it's relatively unchanged for men age 35 and older. So recording differences don't completely explain the recent increases, especially for young people. For older women, the combined rates of anxiety and depression have decreased recently. Other statistics, which are completely independent of this database, show time trends that could be related to increasing anxiety and depression. The national suicide statistics also show increases in suicide attempts for the two youngest age groups of men and women. Uh, the incidence of self-harm has also increased over the same time period for both genders. It isn't clear how directly these changes are related to anxiety specifically, but they're certainly consistent with an increasing burden of mental illness. So to summarize, the rate of generalized anxiety diagnosis was higher for women compared to men across all age groups. Rates of generalized anxiety show sharp increases from 2014 to 2018 for patients 18 to 24 years and 25 to 34 years. This pattern holds for both men and women, but it's especially pronounced in young women. In contrast, the generalized anxiety rates among patients age 55 years and older don't mirror the increases we see in the younger patients. These older patients actually show stability or slight decreases in generalized anxiety rates. Now, longitudinal databases are really terrific for identifying trends, but they don't usually provide good explanations for them. So what could explain the recent increase in anxiety in young people, and especially in young women? Social media use might be contributing to it. Uh, several studies have shown associations be between increased social media use and anxiety in teenagers and young adults. However, those studies were not really designed to assess causality. It might be that people suffering from anxiety are just more likely to engage with social media and not that social media use is causing the anxiety per se. Other explanations include cuts to social services that may disproportionately affect young people. For example, housing, university or apprenticeship opportunities and employment have re recently become less certain. So for young people starting their careers, increasing uncertainty in these areas might be quite distressing. While these changes would actually have less impact on people with already established careers and retired people. It'll be a few more years before we have the data to really look at the impact of the pandemic on these trends. What I can say with confidence at this point is the pandemic didn't help reduce anxiety and we have every reason to think that at least the high levels of anxiety that were present in the run-up to the pandemic remain a societal problem today. So now we'll talk about treatments. In order to start thinking about treatments for generalized anxiety, it's helpful to view the disease of anxiety as a feedback loop. This picture is an oversimplification of a complicated neurological process, but uh, it's meant to il illustrate why anxiety becomes self-reinforcing. It works like this. When someone experiences anxiety, they may become hypervigilant or misinterpret signs of danger or threat in their environment. This heightened state of awareness can cause them to perceive even minor stressors to be significant threats. The interpretation of what's happening, cognition, interacts with mood, affect, as well as the anatomy and neurochemistry of the brain. This analysis leads to what the brain determines to be appropriate behavior. And the circuit is a well-connected feedback loop. But the interpretation, the impact on mood, neurobiology, and finally behavior are all reinforcing the anxiety. The good news about the circuit, though, is that changing any of the components will change everything. It just has to start somewhere. Again, this is a gross oversimplification of something that's very complicated, but the psychological therapies attempt to change the circuit starting with interpretations and behaviors. 
while the drug therapies are working on the biology and mood. Both a drug approach and a psychiatric approach will ulti ultimately alter all of the components in the circuit because of the way that they're all connected. More good news is that there are effective drug treatments for generalized anxiety. Actually, both drug and pharmacologic treatments have been shown to be effective. Among the available drug therapies, I've listed several medication classes that have been shown to reduce anxiety symptoms, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail later. Among the psychological approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy is a talk therapy that focuses on really changing the automatic negative thoughts, so interpretations in my last slide, that can contribute to and worsen anxiety. It's the best studied of the psychological approaches for anxiety, and it's been shown to be effective. Currently, drug therapies are considered the first line treatment because they're substantially less resource intensive, CBT is traditionally provided to an individual patient or at most a small group. Some studies have shown slightly bigger effects with drugs compared to psychological therapies, but there are no definitive trials that actually randomized people with anxiety to CBT or a drug. So these comparisons are murky. Regardless of the relative efficacy, some people have difficulty taking drugs and others are completely unwilling to take them. So there will always be a place for psychological treatment options. I'm hopeful that a combination of app-based CBT and artificial intelligence will make psychological treatment for anxiety a viable option for more people. So we initially wanted to examine trials comparing CBT to drug treatments, but we didn't find any clinical trials that actually randomized people with anxiety to one of these two modalities. In fact, we tried to do this randomized trial at UCL. It was called TASCA. And there were severe problems enrolling patients who were willing to be randomized. So the trial had to be stopped early. So we settled for an analysis comparing available drug therapies for generalized anxiety. Unfortunately, pharmaceutical companies don't have much incentive to test their product against drugs that have already been proven to be effective in treating anxiety. To obtain regulatory approval, they only need to demonstrate a reasonable safety profile and better efficacy compared to placebo. These comparisons might be good enough for the regulatory hurdle, but since doctors don't typically treat patients with placebo, they're not of much help when a doctor is trying to decide among active therapies. However, some drug companies did execute randomized trials comparing active drugs to each other, a lot of that for marketing purposes. But uh, there were several academic and government-funded trials which also compared active treatments. Our goal was to synthesize the findings of all the randomized drug trials and generalized anxiety so we could estimate how the available and recommended drugs compared to each other. The technique we used is called a mixed treatment comparison or MTC. This statistical technique is also called a network meta-analysis. Um, I'm gonna use MTC. So MTC is combined direct evidence that is drugs tested in the same trial with indirect evidence, which is when there are two different trials, but they have at least one drug in common. So in my diagram, panel A shows a direct comparison. Drug X, Y, and Z are all tested in the same trial, and that's shown with the blue lines connecting them. Panel B shows two trials, one comparing X to Y in blue, and one comparing Z to Y in green. Because X and Z have a common comparator in Y, we can estimate how X and Z compare to each other. So a mixed treatment comparison shown in panel C takes this one step further to include all the direct and indirect comparisons across all the trials. 
This analysis started out with an extensive literature search, which identified 89 randomized trials for generalized anxiety that were published between January 1994 and August 2017. The trials contained randomized comparisons of 22 different active drugs and placebo, with a total of over 25,000 patients. This picture is called a network diagram. It shows all the direct comparisons that were used in the analysis. The thickness of the lines is determined by how many trials contain each comparison. So we can see that there are a lot of comparisons of active drugs to placebo. These are the thick red lines, but there are also multiple trials comparing, for example, I'm not sure if you can see this pregabalin to benzodiazepine here. Um, and then of course you can see that there are a lot of combinations that only have a single trial and a few that have no trials connecting them. There aren't many scales to measure the severity of generalized anxiety. And luckily all the randomized trials included the most common one, which is called the Hamilton Anxiety Scale or HAM-A. Although the mixed treatment comparison actually produces pairwise comparisons for every combination of drugs, this graph just shows the average change in HAMA from baseline to the end of the trial for each drug compared to placebo. However, we can look across these estimates to identify the most effective treatments. I've grouped these by drug class. So starting from the left, benzodiazepine includes drugs like diazepam, also known as Valium. SSRIs include well-known drugs like fluoxetine, also known as Prozac. Uh, and in general, the means, the mean change in HAMA are shown as circles, and the 95% credible intervals are shown as black lines. Credible interval measure the amount of uncertainty in the comparisons. So the number of trials and the number of patients in each trial are the primary drivers of the width of the credible interval. So a drug like bupropion here um, was only used in 41 patients across two trials, and we see this interval is very wide. Uh, on the other hand, for Gabalin over here, was tested in almost 2,000 patients across 11 trials. So the uncertainty is much lower and the credible inter interval is a lot more narrow. For Gabalin is actually an interesting drug. It was uh, developed for epilepsy, but it's shown good results for anxiety as we can see here. A UCL sponsored trial called Petra was just recently funded partly as a result of this analysis to look at this further in primary care. Uh, in addition, this analysis shows that the SNRIs, duloxetine and venlafaxine, were very effective compared to placebo and the uncertainty around these comparisons is low because they were studied in a lot of relatively large trials. Many of the SSRIs, including sertraline, escitalopram, and fluoxetine, were also effective compared to placebo. Sertraline, which is over here, is actually the first line drug recommended for generalized anxiety in the NICE guidelines. Benzodiazepines, patiapin, several other drugs were also effective. Uh, all of the circles that are filled in blue were statistically better than placebo, although many of these were limited by few trials, small sample sizes, so more uncertainty. Now, obviously, if patients have a hard time taking drugs, they may stop them prematurely. Drugs definitely don't work if they aren't taken, so it's important to look at tolerability as well as efficacy. As a measure of tolerability, we just looked at the number of patients who discontinued each treatment. And this graph shows the odds ratios for discontinuing treatment compared to placebo and the 95% credible intervals. Many drugs, all the ones in circles in gray, 
had tolerability indistinguishable from placebo, which is not surprising. However, the credible intervals are very wide for a lot of these drugs, so we can't rule out smaller differences in tolerability based on the data we have. Only pregabalin here was significantly better tolerated than placebo. Um, there were a few drugs, including benzodiazepine, paroxetine, quetiapine, which were significantly less tolerable than placebo. So to summarize the treatment findings, there are several effective drug treatments for anxiety across many different classes of drugs. Overall, about two out of three patients respond to the first drug treatment. And for patients who don't get sufficient improvement from the first choice, half do improve with the second choice. So initial failure doesn't mean we need to give up. So recent prescribing patterns. Since we've looked at which drugs are effective and well tolerated, we can actually compare this to the prescribing patterns in UK. This analysis is using that same thin database and the same time scale as the anxiety incident study. Among patients not taking psychotropic medication before generalized anxiety diagnosis, about half received drug treatment in the first year following diagnosis. There's been a slight increase in the proportion receiving medication since about 2006. Note that NICE actually recommends trying some lower level interventions before using drugs. So hopefully some of the patients who didn't receive drugs benefited from those lower level interventions and didn't need anything further. This slide looks at specific drug classes. First, SSRIs. The proportion using SSRIs has increased steadily over the study period. Benzodiazepines. The NICE guidelines recommend against benzodiazepines as a long-term treatment for anxiety due to potential addiction and sometimes fatal interactions with other drugs and alcohol. This recommendation is apparent in the prescribing patterns. The rates of benzodiazepine use began decreasing around 2008, and this decrease continued through 2018. Tricyclic antidepressants uh, were never frequently used for anxiety, but their use has fallen slightly lately. And antipsychotics and SNRIs are seldom used to treat anxiety in UK primary care. So to summarize prescribing trends, about half of patients receive an anti-anxiety medication prescription from their GP in the first year after recording anxiety or symptoms. SSRIs are the most commonly prescribed drug, which is consistent with the NICE anxiety guidelines. And benzodiazepine use has fallen over the study period, which is consistent with the NICE guidelines. So, a couple of conclusions. Um, the incidence of generalized anxiety disorder is increasing in young people and especially in young women. Several drugs across several different classes of medication are effective at reducing symptoms and are fairly well tolerated. And in UK primary care, SSRIs are the most common class of medication prescribed. So are we ready? The short answer is no. Um, we really need to understand what's happening here, especially with young people and the reasons for their recent increase in anxiety. This is going to probably require a combination of qualitative, quantitative, and ethnographic approaches to try to sort out. Uh, what we can do that's sort of lower hanging fruit is to make sure GPs are aware of these recent trends and they're on the lookout for anxiety. But ultimately, um, we also need better psychological interventions. Uh, CBT is not the only approach, but it's but others, I think, lack the um, supporting research, and it would be great if we could fill that in. 
finally, uh, this can't be a couple of people deciding what to do. We really need to take into account all of the stakeholders in these trends. Um, and that means we need to include young people in these discussions as we move forward. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, I'm hoping we're set up now for um, a discussion. So uh, I'm sure someone will tell me if we can't be heard, but we've had a couple of questions already from um, Slido. And we're very well equipped for the discussion because we, um, we're also joined by Owen Nazareth, as I mentioned at the beginning, who's a um, professor in primary care with a very long standing uh, interest in um, the management of, of anxiety. In fact, I seem to recall you ran an innovative anxiety clinic in your practice in, in Hampstead. So let's get kicked off. Um, one of the, well, this, why is it that young people are experiencing this epidemic of anxiety? It's absolutely striking. I think we've seen very clearly from the evidence that April um, presented that um, uh, it's real. So what's going on here? What's what's affecting young people that isn't affecting um, us older um, people? I mean, I think April has raised some very important points in her presentation. Um, there are, the study doesn't answer that question, but we can only hypothesize or come to some sort of uh, informed decision. Uh, some informed opinions as to what's causing it. But it, I mean, there is a lot more social media usage and a lot of pressure on young people. That could be one possibility. I think one of the suggestions from the audience was their fear about climate change. Um, and there are other possible issues around the pressures on the other people. But I think this is an area for further research. We need a lot more information as to what the causes are. I think we ought to get you to sit by the table, though, and I'm not sure everybody can, um, can, can see you there. Yeah. And that's better. Good. Good. Okay, thank you for that. Um, um, well, another possible factor that, um, that someone raised in the Sligo was um, that it could be something to do with climate anxiety. Certainly that's been very much in the news. Um, and it, I mean, it's a very, very real concern. Um, any, any comments, April, do you have anything to, to add to that? So, so, our youngest representative here, I think fair to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I think certainly um, with climate change, especially, there's a feeling of powerlessness that uh, can certainly be quite anxiety producing. Um, it's it's the um, sort of platonic bad thing that's going to happen. You, you really couldn't develop a better example of something to worry about. Um, I don't see the worry being alleviated. It will be better when we know if the actions we're taking are having an impact and what actions to take, but no, it's, I think it is contributing. Yeah. Um, I recall a conversation that we had when we first saw these results, April, and, um, um, I, and I think you asked me what it was that perhaps my parents had been worrying about when I was born, and um, I pointed out it was the, probably the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, 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 and I remember you saying then that, um, and, and it rings very true, that um, periodically in life there are things that we've become very concerned about. I remember the emergence of, say, AIDS, um, has been a massive, particularly working in health, has been a, an enormous concern. And I, you know, I remember a presentation from the then, I was working in Leeds, and the, the then Director of Public Health in Leeds, um, where he presented a number of scenarios, and, and um, all of them looked terrible for, for, for life in, um, in, you know, in our immediate locality. And of course, um, AIDS has definitely resulted in being just as big an international um, disaster and emergency as that um, colleague was presenting. 
but it didn't affect our local community in Leeds in the way that he was suggesting. So after we, as we get older, we survive many of these um, the, the, these crises, and we find that they they don't turn out to be maybe quite as bad as we expected them to be, or as you know, and it, it can be quite sure. negative. Sure. So so that would also explain the reduction in anxiety among the older people. Yeah. If it's relative to what you've been through in your life, and you've been through the Cold War, and you've been through the Cuban Missile Crisis then, you know, uncertainty, even like the financial crisis in 2008, might seem like something that's lousy, but you get through it. I mean, it is, it's actually, I agree with what you said, it's learned behavior. So once you've experienced anxiety and learn how to deal with it, and that's not what younger people, or that's what younger people are learning. Uh, and that's why anxiety levels are expressed at a high level, but with age, Coping mechanisms develop, and I think that would be could be explained psychologically as well. I mean, the other point I wanted to raise on this issue is our physiology hasn't changed that much, but our but uh, technology has changed tremendously, and it's that uh, facing of our physiology against rapid technology which could explain some of these things as well. I, I have no evidence for it, okay. but I worry about social media. Yes. Um, I, I, my own children grew up at the beginnings of, of social media. I remember when I was a child, when I was at school, um, I could go hide, go and hide at home. At the end of the day, um, whatever, there, there, were, there were safe places to be. Um, but I think there's, there can be no hiding from social media. And, and I think that might be quite challenging. Well, um, moving on, we've got a question from um, Lorraine in the chat. Um, you might have this info to hand, but wondering about anxiety. The, in the anxiety missed primary care group on the iceberg slide, what other conditions do people get diagnosed okay. with? So, yes, it's a good question. Anxiety. It's a good question. I mean, don't forget this is the hidden bit of the iceberg. So, and anxiety is a very under researched area in primary care. So, we don't really have evidence, but we do, we can get some insights from depression which is a better research area in primary care. And what we found is a lot of these people do present with physical symptoms. The reality is that when somebody comes to their GP with a physical symptom, you work down the physical trajectory. So if they complain of, um, of palpitations, you will be working down uh, cardiovascular diseases. If they complain of difficulty breathing, these are all signs of anxiety or panic, but they are they're followed down another track. And so that's why these diagnoses are most frequently missed. Um, now, this certainly holds true for depression, and there's no reason why it shouldn't hold true for, for anxiety as well. But I think that's the most likely explanation, is that it's the physical, psychological interface which is probably less clearly recognized in, in primary care, partly because of the overwhelming nature of physical presentations. And perhaps the person not being willing to also share their emotional state with the GP, because there's still a lot of stigma around mental health disorders. And it's much easier to talk about a physical health problem or to come in with a physical health problem than to say, actually, I'm feeling terribly anxious, I can't sleep in my face. But those, um, those social mores, social traits seem to be changing, don't they? Because I, I, I remember you saying um, with the anxiety clinic that you, you ran, that uh, you couldn't get um, young people, and young men in particular, into the clinic to, um, to, to address their anxiety. Um, and now it's quite clear from yeah. April's research results that very large numbers of yeah. Um, young I mean, people and young men, yes. including young men, are consulting for anxiety. I think I think it's a very good point. I think younger people are more able to talk about it and present with their symptoms, and and that's a real positive thing. Uh, I still think there are people about the age of fifty who are less able to do so. Whether that would explain some of the findings which April has presented in terms of uh, static rates or drop in rates, it's hard to say. But there's still an age divide in terms of the ability to talk about mental illness and also around the stigma associated with it. Yeah, and you know, as much as I 
um, get sort of annoyed with some of the celebrity need to share all kinds of things that are going on in people's lives. What I think has had a benefit is a lot of celebrities have been very forthright about their own struggles with mental illness, which has made it, you know, more common. It's it's become apparent that this is something that can affect anyone. Um, I guess in um, my generation, as a, as a child, I remember famous um, um, people on television starting to talk about their serious cancer diagnosis. Um, and we've seen the change in you know, society's discussion around such challenges, and yeah. um, which, which, from my point of view, is extremely healthy and, yeah. and, and, and constructive. And, yeah. and it's great to see the same kind of signs in, um, you know, in, in, in mental health issues. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. Um, is there a connection between mental health problems such as anxiety and others? Um, like psychosis or Richie Bagard, or uh, is there something yes. convergent here? Is there something, I mean, something bigger going it's on? It's really a good question because um, I, I must say that all mental illnesses are connected in some way, so few of them exist on their own. Uh, but the question around anxiety and psychosis has been an area of much interest. Clinically, it has been well recognized that people with psychosis do have anxiety disorders. Now, I think some there's not that much research in this area, but some of the papers suggest it's as high as 40 to 70 percent. The range indicates the lack of evidence because they vary from study to study. I think there are probably five or six papers on this. Um, now, what is what is the connection? Does psychosis cause anxiety? Does anxiety is, or is anxiety a precursor of psychosis? Is not very clear. But for example, if a person is over anxious, it heightens their paranoid symptoms in feeling that people are following them or people are talking about them. And so those are very clear features of psychosis. Now, is it anxiety? Is anxiety predicting something of that sort? We still don't know. Or are the two so closely linked that it's hard to tell? Likewise, I mean, I think this suggestion around God is more around these, these sort of uh, delusional beliefs that they have direct messages from God. Um, is that related to anxiety? Is that related to periods of, um, of heightened, um, heightened uh, emotional levels? Um, links have been made, and there are few cohort studies. Cohort studies means where you start up with a person with anxiety and follow them through. But some of the studies done in younger people suggest that anxiety could be, and, and these are only 18 month follow-up studies, suggest that anxiety could be a precursor. And we're talking about quite severe anxiety in an 18 year old, 20 year old, will actually uncover itself as psychosis in about two or three years down the line. So it's something that we need to be vigilant uh, as clinicians, particularly in general practice, because psychosis is a diagnosis which takes a long time, it can take up to four or five years, and, and it often presents with symptoms of anxiety, depression, and others. So the two are linked. Um, there's certainly a link between them, and uh, the long-term research on this can be improved. There's some stuff that can be improved. Changing tax cycling, um, the, one of the challenges of studying um, changes in, in um, um, society is that lots of things change at once. That's why we do, do randomized trials. And um, one, of the, one of the questions has asked a very interesting question on whether there's, there could be um, any connection between the increased anxiety in young people um, and an increase in knife crime, of course, both, both have increased massively, um, and particularly in, in London for night crime, um, but in many other particular urban centres. Um, can you see any links there? Can you see any links there? It's, it's really hard to tell, really. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Night crime is, 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 a, is a consequence of aggression and right, often gang rivalry and certain behaviour patterns 
I mean, we, we get back to the same question. Is anxiety, high levels of anxiety in young people leading to knife crimes? <laughs> or is our knife crimes a manifestation of anxiety? I don't know, really. But it, I mean, there's certain, there's something in common here. It's a heightened level of emotional, um, emotional stress of some sort. And, and so the link is possible. Yeah, I mean, so it, it yeah. could be like a sort of a classic confounding situation exactly. where the uh, minutia or whatever, the the climate is actually causing both yeah. because it's causing yeah. a heightened emotional state. And yeah. you have the fight people that go this way and the flight yeah. people who go that way. Yeah, right. So it might be something else underlying um, yeah. both changes, but sort of making them happen together. We've only got a little bit of time left. I think we've, oh, we've, got, a, we've got a new question. How much would you argue that amygdala contributes to anxiety? Amygdala? Amygdala in the brain. Yeah. My, um, my <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, well, I think, I think there is some, I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I, I, I know enough about amygdala to say that there is a link with anxiety, but the exact mechanisms whereby it works, I'm sure a neuroscientist has, has probably done some work, although I must say that anxiety is poorly researched. And the amygdala has been, uh, has been researched in all sorts of other areas of mental health. Um, but I really don't know the answer to that in terms of true neuroscience studies. Um, are, there, are there scanning studies that have looked at anxiety disorders and what's happening to them in amygdala? Are there uh, functional studies looking at pathways? Well, actually, yeah, yeah there are. There I are. mean, and, and the real difference is in how fear manif manifests in these yeah. fMRIs, where it's really amygdala and yeah. one axis. Whereas in anxiety, there's a lot more interaction between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Okay. So it's, it's processing rather than sort of reacting. So one very last question, I think. Trends over time. Um, do you know if the effects of anxiety, depression, medicines decline or wane over time um, if people are on them for a long time? Uh, there's no evidence that the effects wane over time if the person is taking the drug. But what does happen, and this is my clinical experience, is that people who've taken a drug for a long time start missing it because they think they're quite well. Uh, they, they probably will take it every week alternate day and gradually probably once or twice a week. And so the effect is lost. But if somebody, there's no evidence that if somebody adheres to the medication that, uh, that the effect is lost. So I think behind this question is, does the, does the body sort of get adjusted or accustomed to the drug? A bit like, a, like one's body gets accustomed to alcohol and they need higher and higher levels of alcohol. That is not true of antidepressants as far as the research goes. As long as the depression is stable, right? Yeah. If something exacerbated the depression. Yeah. yeah. So, we, uh, so uh, of course, we find ourselves talking about anxiety and depression. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I feel like it's such a strong overlap, and at least in trials that you've attempted to recruit to, it's very difficult to um, yeah. to separate the two. Um, but I'm afraid, I, I, I think we could probably carry on discussing this fascinating topic all day, um, but, but we're not allowed to do that, so we have to draw this to a close. Um, um, thank you so much, everybody, um, for, um, for, for joining us um, this afternoon or later online. Um, thanks very much, April, for a, a superb um, talk and for the uh, lovely questions online. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you.